Quick guide to the management of keratoconus. Part 11 Corneal crosslinking techniques and protocols. Techniques and protocols of corneal crosslinking are epithelium based and protocol based. The epithelium based techniques they include epithelium off technique and epithelium on techniques. The protocol based classification includes Dresden protocol, Hafizi protocol, accelerated protocols, epi on protocols, other techniques, and the prophylactic protocol. Before we start with the protocols, we have to know the riboflavine solutions. There are solutions used for epithelium off techniques, two types of, of solutions, the isotonic, which contains 20% dextran, and the hypotonic, which is dextran free. The isotonic causes shrinkage in the stroma during application, while the hypotonic, because it is dextran free, it swells the stroma after application. In the epithelium on or the transepithelial techniques, the riboflavine solutions are of two types. Ricrolin plus, which is hypotonic or dextran free and used for eontophoresis, and Ricrolin TE or transepithelial, which is isotonic with 15% dextran and it is used for other techniques of epithelial on. But both types contain sodium EDTA and trometamol as permeability enhancers. Before we start, we have to know that the application of UV through the epithelium will cause absorp absorption of the energy of the UVA. 20% of the energy will be absorbed by the epithelium and 5% will be absorbed by Bowman, and only 5% of the energy will reach the endothelium. In addition, if we remove the epithelium and apply the riboflavine, if we apply it for 3 minutes, it will reach only the anterior third of the stroma, and if we want it to reach the deep stroma, we have to apply it at least for 30 minutes. Now let us start with the protocols. We will start with the Dresden protocol. Dresden protocol is applied on very good thickness corneas, like when it is more than 400 microns without the epithelium. We use an isotonic riboflavine solution. We apply one drop every five minutes for 30 minutes. And after that, we check the green flare in the anterior chamber with the cobalt blue light. If still no flare, we can add more drops until the flare, the flare is clear. After that, we apply UVA. It is 3 milliwatt per square centimeter for 30 minutes, and there is no need for riboflavine application during UVA. This is a very important remark. No need to apply riboflavine during UVA application. This is Dresden protocol. Now, Hafizi protocol is used when the corneas are between 350 microns and 400 microns without the epithelium. We start first as Dresden protocol. We use the isotonic for 30 minutes, and then we apply one drop per one minute of hypotonic riboflavine for five minutes in order to swell the stroma. And we can extend these five minutes for one or two minutes until we reach the uh, uh, thickness of the stroma uh, more than 400 microns. And then we can apply the UVA as in Dresden, so there is no need for any additional drops during UVA application as in Dresden protocol. So the difference is just addition of hypotonic riboflavine after 30 minutes in order to swell the cornea to reach the 400 microns. The accelerated protocols. 
Riboflavin is applied as in Dresden or Hafizi after removal of the epithelium, of course. The UVA can be used in two types, either 9 mW per square centimeter for 10 minutes or 18 mW per square centimeter for 5 minutes. Now, this is evidence-based. These two types are the only evidence-based of accelerated application. The pulsed cross-linking with higher energies still needs more evidence. Now we come to the epion technique. In the epion techniques, we leave the epithelium intact in order to uh, avoid pain after the operation and make the operation more comfortable and avoid some side effects, especially the infections. And this is very important in children population. But what's the problem now? If we apply the conventional riboflavin, the epithelium uh, will make as a barrier against the distribution of the riboflavin into the stroma. So in this case, we have to use permeability enhancers in order to make breaks into the epithelium and allow the riboflavin to diffuse into the stroma. Now, the permeability enhancers are benzalkonium chloride, sodium EDTA, tetracaine, proparacaine, ethanol, and gentamicin antibiotics. All these enhancers can make breaks into the epithelium in order to allow the riboflavin to go through and distribute into the stroma. There are four types of epion techniques. The manual, eontophoresis, intrastromal pockets created by femtosecond, and intrastromal tunnels created by femtosecond as well. Starting with the manual epion, we leave the epithelium intact. We use isotonic riboflavin combined with the enhancers. We have to apply this type of riboflavin until we see, visually, complete and homogeneous saturation of the stroma. And this will take time. It is time consuming. It may take between 15 minutes to 3 hours to achieve this complete and homogeneous saturation. Then. We wait five minutes to allow the solution, the riboflavin solution, in order to clear away from the epithelium in order to make better penetration of the UVA. And this can be seen by the cobalt blue uh, light on the sleep lamp. After that, we apply the UVA as in Dresden protocol or by using the 9 or 18 milliwatt accelerated protocols. Now, the efficacy of this um, technique depends on saturation and the technique itself but many studies have shown that its effect is just 20% of Dresden protocol and most probably it is transient so this type is reserved for children and for corneas with the critical thickness eontophoresis we deliver charged molecules into the tissue by using small electric current and the application of hypotonic riboflavin for five minutes in a special device as shown in the image. After that, UVA is applied without any further application of riboflavin and the UVA can be used as in Dresden protocol, three milliwatt per square centimeter for 30 minutes or the accelerated, the two types which are evidence-based which are 9 milliwatt or 18 milliwatt. The intrastromal pockets. We create a pocket which is 100 microns in depth from corneal surface, and the diameter of the pocket is 7 millimeters. Then we inject very gently 0.1 milli of isotonic riboflavin twice into this pocket and leave the riboflavin for two minutes in order to diffuse and distribute into the anterior stroma. And then we apply the UVA in seven milliwatt per square centimeter for 15 minutes. The intrastromal tunnels is just the same in uh, principle. We create by the femtosecond the tunnels, and then we inject 
the riboflavin and after the diffusion of riboflavin we apply the UVA other techniques we have dia disruptor and the contact lens assisted corneal crosslinking dia disruptor is an instrument that makes fenestrations and punctures through the intact epithelium in order to facilitate the penetration of the riboflavin into the stroma contact lens assisted corneal crosslinking after removal of the epithelium if the stroma is less than 400 microns we can add a contact lens saturated saturated with the riboflavin in order to add an artificial thickness of about 90 to 110 microns and in this case the amount of UVA that reaches the endothelium will be not harmful the prophylactic protocol if we look at this image this cornea seems to be normal but if we study it following the 12 points we can find that the K reading is a moderate risk because it is between 47 and 50 and the thinnest location y coordinate is a moderate risk because it is between minus 0 0.5 and minus 1 if we come to the maps we will find that there is no significant srax and the is difference on the sagittal map is within normal limits on the elevation map using the best fit sphere we can see symmetric hourglass and the value corresponding to the thinnest location is within normal limits if we use the best fit toric ellipsoid within the central 5 mm zone the uh, values are also within normal limits the same can be said for the back surface but when we come to the pachymetry map we find that the is difference is more than 30 microns which is another third moderate risk factors so some doctors may do prophylactic protocol which is application of corneal crosslinking in addition to the prk this application may may be like 10 to 15 minutes of the conventional riboflavin after prk of course followed by two minutes only of 45 milliwatt per square centimeter of uva or 10 to 15 minutes of conventional riboflavin application followed by three minutes of 30 milliwatt per square centimeter of uva now we have to remember that this um, very short time of uh, riboflavin application is not sufficient to let the riboflavin reach the deep stroma in addition this high intensity of uva is still not evidence-based now there is another technique called the LASIK X or LASIK plus cross-linking. After LASIK, um, riboflavin, the conventional riboflavin, is applied for only one minute, and then the flap is repositioned, and the UVA is applied for 80 seconds of 45 milliwatt per square centimeter. Now, the first protocol, which is the PRK plus cross-linking in corneas with moderate to high risk is still not evidence-based the LASIK X is still debatable actually there is no prophylactic protocol why let us discuss this from three points the first point is from a point of view of refractive surgery as an elective procedure because it is an elective procedure, so we have to apply it on green and clean cornea and shouldn't be applied on corneas with moderate or high risk. Why we should do this? It is elective, not emergent uh, uh, surgery. The other point is there is unpredictable effect of corneal cross-linking because there is 
an unmeasured flattening effect of the cross-linking. So we don't want to expose this cornea to unpredictable results as we are doing refractive surgery, which is an elective procedure. The third point is statistical issues. If we want to test the effect of any treatment on a population, we have to make two groups, a studied group on which we apply the treatment and a control group in which we don't apply this treatment. So, if we want to study the effect of this prophylactic treatment by cross-linking, we have to do, for example, PRK plus cross-linking on the study group, and we have to do only PRK without cross-linking on the control group. And these two, two groups should be very symmetrical in moderate and high risk in order to be matchable. And then we have to follow these two groups for at least 5 to 10 years in order to check the percentage of ectasia development in these two groups and then we can judge whether the application of cross-linking as a prophylactic treatment has given its desired effect in preventing ectasia development. Now the big question is how can we apply PRK without cross-linking on people with moderate or high risk. This is not ethical. In addition, none of the published studies is depending on such kind of controlled studies. So we have half studies. We don't have an evidence based for these treatments. So, so there is no prophylact prophylactic protocol. So to conclude, in order to classify the protocols according to efficacy, if we take the Dresden protocol as a scale or as a caliper, assuming that it gives the 100% of effect, after the Dresden protocol or next to it comes the accelerated with the two evidence-based um, energies, which are the 9 milliwatt milli and the 18 milliwatt. Next to that comes Hafizi protocol and eontophoresis. Next to that comes other epion techniques. And after that comes the accelerated pulsed high energy. But there is no place for the prophylactic protocol. Thank you very much. And I hope you join us on Sinjab Academy on the Telegram. Goodbye.